Netanyahu with VOA's Middle East Monitor. Coming up, further North Korean links to the Iranian nuclear program are reported. Most people would argue that the North Korean nuclear program is out ahead of Iran, and we don't want Iran having that assistance. Israel demands tougher action on Iran's nuclear program. International negotiators meet, but little progress is made on Mideast peace. And Libyans are optimistic about democracy, but challenges loom. It's ahead on VOA. News media in Northeast Asia are reporting details of alleged cooperation between Iran and North Korea in trying to build atomic bombs. VOA correspondent Steve Herman in Seoul reports such joint activities have been suspected for years. South Korea's foreign ministry and the National Intelligence Service say they cannot comment on fresh reports linking Pyongyang's atomic efforts to Iran. Officials with the agencies considered at the forefront of monitoring North Korea's nuclear programs say the allegations, apparently leaked by diplomats in recent days, involve classified information. The allegations follow last Tuesday's report by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's nuclear watchdog. The IAEA's most comprehensive assessment yet about Iran's nuclear programs details what it says is evidence of Iran's covert and continuous effort since 2003 to build a nuclear bomb going far beyond the stated goals of energy and medical research. Iran's top envoy to the IAEA last Friday called the report a fabrication based on lousy intelligence by the United States and its allies. The 25-page report has since been leaked and makes no mention of a link between Iran and North Korea. But last Friday, UN investigators gave a private technical presentation to the 35 member states of the IAEA Board of Governors. Since then, diplomats have been quoted anonymously by South Korea media, alleging that hundreds of North Korean scientists and engineers have been working at nuclear and missile facilities in Iran. A Japanese newspaper says among the Iranian sites the North Koreans have been visiting are three research centers carrying out simulations of how to trigger nuclear weapons. Bruce Bennett, a senior defense analyst at the RAND Corporation, which conducts research and analysis for the U.S. military and intelligence agencies, says experts for years have been suspicious about this type of cooperation. There have been stories of Iranians at the nuclear tests in North Korea, for example. So if information is really being shared, then you've got a much more dangerous situation because most people would argue that the North Korean nuclear program is out ahead of Iran, and we don't want Iran having that assistance. The London-based International Institute of Strategic Studies in a report this year characterized the cooperation as mutual. It said North Korea has a technological edge over Iran in uranium enrichment and the manufacture of nuclear-related equipment such as high-strength steel. The IISS report said North Korea's weapons programs also benefit from Iranian technology. Bennett of the RAND Corporation says the international community needs to pay more attention to the nuclear links between North Korea and Iran. But stopping that or even slowing it down is going to be complicated. The people can travel to Iran without having to go through places where we can stop them. The South Korean media reports say the North Koreans enter Iran covertly through other countries such as Russia and China. The North Koreans are said to be employed at 10 nuclear and missile facilities in Iran and are apparently rotated every few months. The Washington Post reported that Western diplomats and nuclear experts briefed on the IAEA findings say that Iran has reached the threshold of nuclear capability with crucial technology linked to North Korea and Pakistan. Steve Herman, VOA News, Seoul. U.S. President Barack Obama, speaking in Hawaii at the conclusion of the Asia-Pacific Leaders Summit, says the United States, China, and Russia are united on the need to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. VOA senior White House correspondent Dan Robinson reports from Honolulu. President Obama says his talks with the Chinese and Russian presidents in Hawaii produced agreement on one major objective. All three of us entirely agree on the objective which is making sure that Iran does not weaponize nuclear power and that we don't trigger a nuclear arms race uh, in the region. Mr. Obama said the recent International Atomic Energy Agency report confirmed that while Iran does not possess a nuclear weapon, it has engaged in practices contrary to its international obligations. He says the U.S., China, and Russia will consult closely on available options to pressure Iran 
to see if the issue can be solved diplomatically. Mr. Obama repeated that the U.S. takes no options off the table regarding Iran and believes Iran's government knows how determined the world is to prevent a nuclear-armed Iran and an arms race in the region. Dan Robinson, VOA News, with President Obama in Honolulu. Israel is demanding tougher international action on Iran's nuclear program following new revelations by the U.N. nuclear watchdog. Robert Berger has details from Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says a report by the International Atomic Energy Agency proves what Israel has been saying all along. He told the cabinet that the report shows that Iran is systematically developing nuclear weapons. In his first public comment since the report was published last week, Mr. Netanyahu said every responsible government must draw the obvious conclusions. He called for the international community to stop Iran's race for nuclear weapons, which he said endangers the peace of the entire world. Iran says its nuclear program is for peaceful purposes, and it described the IAEA report as politically motivated. But Israel sees Iran's nuclear program as an existential threat, and it has been alarmed by statements by Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who has threatened to wipe the Jewish state off the map. Mr. Netanyahu has said there are two ways to force Iran to abandon its quest for nuclear weapons, crippling sanctions, and a credible military option. But if the international community fails to stop Iran, Israel has threatened to take military action on its own. Iran has warned that if Israel or the United States launch an attack on its nuclear facilities, it will retaliate with an iron fist. With that in mind, Israel has been conducting civil defense drills to prepare the home front for possible ballistic missile attacks from Iran. Robert Berger for VOA News. Jerusalem. We invite you to join in with your views at our online poll. This week we ask, how serious is the Syrian regime about peace? You can cast your vote at voanews.com slash me and discuss the issue on Facebook on our Middle East Voices page. In the first blush of enthusiasm after the nine-month struggle to oust Muammar Gaddafi, many Libyans are optimistic that the country will be able to move toward democracy, with little payback for the iron rule and atrocities of the past. But some analysts are not so sure. VOA's Al Pesson reports from Tripoli on this report for VOA Television. The private compound from which Muammar Gaddafi ruled Libya has been flat. Youths play on what is left of some of his military vehicles. University students celebrate their newfound freedom. But there's serious work to do. The council that led the Libyan revolution gave way to an interim government, which is to lead the country to elections and a new constitution. Along the way, Libyans will have to decide how to deal with those who supported Gaddafi and those who allegedly committed atrocities in the name of the revolution. Libyan politician Hadi Shalouf of the Justice and Democracy Party hopes to be part of the country's future leadership. If anyone committed any crimes, any violation of human rights, he should be judged. If the people doesn't committed any crimes in that time, we have no any problem. We, they should, these people, they would be should integrated and alive. Rebel fighters also need to be reintegrated. These men are being honored because they handed in their weapons. Rebel fighter Tariq Hussein fought in some of the toughest battles in Misrata and in Gaddafi's hometown, Sirt. He's guarding government buildings now and he thinks reconciliation is already well along the way. I hope God will grant us reconciliation. I think it's already at 70%, and I hope it will reach 100% soon. But some analysts outside Libya are not so sure the country will have such a smooth transition to democracy. They say tribal, regional, and political differences could become more pronounced in the coming months. 
Among them is Anthony Skinner of the Maplecroft Risk Assessment Company, who spoke to VOA via Skype. We have to be careful, mindful of the risks, that you still have a large number of groups that are very well armed, that are very concerned to ensure that they lay their claim to the political landscape. And the concern is now, with Gaddafi actually removed from power and actually killed, that this glue which held these groups together will have disappeared. All the Middle Eastern countries that overthrew their rulers this year are facing various difficulties along the road to democracy. But for now, in Libya, with children playing on the relics of the old regime, most people are eager to put any differences aside, at least for the moment, and to hope that after decades of dictatorship and months of war, they can move forward together. Al Pesson, VOA News, Tripoli. Some of those differences Al mentioned have been on display in the last few days and with deadly effect. At least six people have been killed in fighting between rival militias outside Tripoli, and the government has yet to persuade both sides to disarm. Joining us now on the line from our Middle East Bureau in Cairo is VOA correspondent Elizabeth Errett. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Susan. Say, well, what's going on? Well, as you said, it's, it has been a deadly couple of days. We've had seen some militias from the town of Zawiya and the tribal area of Horshafana, and they're both quite near Tripoli. They've been clashing for at least four days. It's the, the worst fighting and certainly the longest running battle since the death of uh, the former leader, Muammar Gaddafi, last month. One of the big problems is that they're rivals, and neither side wants to disarm until the other does. And so you've got them both in this standoff, and then minor incidents will, will put it, push it into this full-blown full fighting. It's not clear exactly what, what started this particular round. There are said to be some members of the Gaddafi loyalists among the, the Warshafana tribal groups that are taking part in this. Um, some people have even said that Saif al-Islam, Mr. Gaddafi's son and the only member of, of the family who's still at large, was among them or maybe still is among them. None of these things can be, can be confirmed. So just how difficult is it to disarm these people? Well, they've been trying pretty much since the, the National Transitional Council, since it came to Tripoli and, and established the government, has been trying to get these. It was a very high priority for them to get everybody to disarm. They've called on people to turn in their weapons, and it, it was a volunteer army, and, you know, very, the, the favorite phase is ragtag. And, but many of the fighters, you know, did they disarmed, they went back to their old jobs, created new jobs. But for some groups and individuals, um, there really isn't much of an alternative, uh, no jobs to go back to. And this is where the government really needs to help out. They need to provide jobs, training programs, and something not only just stable, but, but it, it's difficult. They have to appeal to, for a lot of these guys, it's, it's after many, many decades of, of oppression and not being able to do anything, not only to be able to speak out, it's very heady to, to be so autonomous and have your own weapons, and that always is a long process to, to get people to act in a more civilian manner after, after something like this. So what are some of the divisions that we're seeing now? Well, in addition to the problems we're seeing in Zawiya and among, between them and, and the Warshafana militias, you also see in Tripoli itself fighting between two, two groups of militias, those from Misrata, which was under siege for a very long time, and Zintan, which um, also had many key players in trying to overthrow Gaddafi. Now, what happens is everybody kind of thinks that they were the key players in this. And you see it across the nation, you know, the, the Western groups. They say they were decisive in winning the battle, and that they took Tripoli while the Eastern rebels were bogged down for months. So you have regional differences, and as I mentioned earlier, this problem that nobody wants to give up their arms until everybody else does. You have the government. This is the latest time, but they repeatedly, repeatedly ask for people to disarm, and it's almost as if you need that moment where you know one, two, three, go, and everybody drops their arms. Unless that happens, it's, it's hard to see immediately that this problem is going to go away. Well, thank you for your insight, Elizabeth. Thank you, Susan. It's a VOA correspondent, Elizabeth Errett, speaking with us from Cairo. Are you looking for a comprehensive daily look at events reshaping the Middle East? Visit voanews.com forward slash me. You'll find VOA's original reporting from the region, in-depth analysis from our Washington team, VIP interviews, online polls, photo essays, and many documentaries. 
bookmark us, or add us to your RSS reader. That's voanews.com forward slash me. International diplomats seeking to restart the stall negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians have held separate meetings with the two parties. VOA Scott Bob has details from Jerusalem. Delegates from the European Union, Russia, the United Nations, and the United States met separately Monday with Israeli and Palestinian negotiators, but expectations of a breakthrough in the stalled peace talks remained low. Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas's political advisor, Nehmer Hamad, indicated there was a willingness to discuss a framework for resuming the talks. He said, we are focusing on two issues. The first issue is the borders of a Palestinian state along the July 4, 1967 lines. The second issue is security. If there is progress on these issues, the Palestinian team is ready to go to the negotiating table. The Israeli negotiator, Yitzhak Molcho, told Israeli radio his team was willing to talk to the Palestinians any time and any place without conditions. Israel has accused the Palestinians of raising more demands as a condition of returning to the table. The chief Palestinian negotiator, Saeb Edekat, said in a statement following his meeting that the Palestinians are ready to discuss all issues once Israel proves its commitment by freezing all construction of Israeli settlements in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. The talks broke down 14 months ago after Israel resumed settlement construction following a 10-month freeze. Settlement construction has since expanded. The international mediators known as the Mideast Quartet two months ago called on the two sides to submit proposals within three months on territory and security, and to commit to reaching a time frame for direct talks by the end of next year. The negotiators reportedly proposed, as a way to ease the deadlock, that the Palestinians drop their demand for a settlement freeze in exchange for Israeli concessions on the borders of a two-state solution. Etikot's statement Monday said Israeli settlements and the two-state solution could not be linked. Partially as a result of the deadlock, the Palestinians in September requested state membership in the United Nations. Palestinian officials recently acknowledged that they did not have the nine votes necessary in the UN Security Council for their application to succeed. The U.S. government, as a permanent council member, has said it would veto any such proposal if it were to pass. The Palestinians two weeks ago were admitted by a large margin as a full member of the UN cultural organization, UNESCO. This brought a cutoff of US funding for the organization in accordance with a long-standing US law. Israel also cut its funding for UNESCO. In addition, it announced an expansion of two settlements around Jerusalem and the suspension of $100 million per month in tax payments to the Palestinian Authority. The Israeli cabinet on Monday voted to maintain the cutoff. Scott Bob, VOA News, Jerusalem. U.S. President Barack Obama says he used a private meeting with French President Nicolas Sarkozy earlier this month to express significant disappointment with a French vote in favor of Palestinians joining the U.N. Cultural Heritage Agency, UNESCO. The president said the main point he made to the French president was his displeasure with the French vote on October 31st. The primary conversation I had with President Sarkozy in that meeting revolved around my significant disappointment that France had voted in favor of the Palestinians joining UNESCO, knowing full well that under our laws that would require the United States from cutting off funding to UNESCO. Mr. Obama refused to comment on a part of his meeting with Mr. Sarkozy earlier this month in France that was accidentally transmitted to a group of reporters in another room. The reporters heard Mr. Sarkozy criticize Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as a liar whom he cannot bear. Mr. Obama appeared to sympathize with Mr. Sarkozy, saying, You may be sick of Mr. Netanyahu, but I have to work with him every day. Concerns are growing over academic freedom in Turkey following the arrest of a well-known university professor under the country's anti-terror laws. The government argues that it is facing a growing threat from the PKK rebel group, which is fighting for greater Kurdish rights. Dorian Jones reports from Istanbul. 
academics at Istanbul's elite Bosrus University protested the early November arrest of fellow professor Busra Ersanli under the country's anti-terror laws. Ersanli was acting as an advisor to the Peace and Democracy Party, the BDP, the country's main legal Kurdish party. Now she's languishing in prison, awaiting trial on charges of supporting the Kurdish rebel group, the PKK. If convicted, she faces up to 20 years in jail. Her detention is part of a new worrying trend, claimed Professor Ayfer Bartu of Bostrich University. She says the crackdown has already taken its toll on academic freedom. There is a lot of self-censorship that is going on at the universities. Uh, a graduate student from our department was detained and a couple of students from other departments were also detained. Some people are worried, worried now because of the research that they are doing because now it's becoming so easy to mark people. They are creating this reality that anyone who even talks about the Kurdish issue is actually a supporter of PKK. It, it didn't used to be that way. Prosecutors claim that attentions are a necessary part of their battle against what they portray as a terrorist conspiracy hatched by the Kurdistan Communities Union, or KCK. The government asserts the group acts as the urban wing of the PKK. Human rights groups say over 5,000 people have been detained and arrested, including Kurdish mayors, trade unionists, human rights workers, as well as academics and students, as part of the government's investigation into the KCK. Critics say the investigation has little to do with fighting terrorism. Richard Howard, a member of the European Parliament's Committee on Turkey, has been following many of the cases. 7,500 pages on the indictment list, but not one mention of any weapon or any violence, seems to suggest that those who say that this is a set of political trials against Kurdish political activists. Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan recently dismissed the growing criticism. Son KCK operasyonları. Kimse bizden bunun da durmasını beklemesin. What is the KCK? Who is behind it? They are defending the KCK without seriously researching these things, he says. Those arrested speak of revolution. Revolutions are made with guns. The prosecutors conducted a wiretap and caught this. Everything will come to light once the indictment is drawn up. The anti-terror laws are also being used against student protesters. Last year, three students who held up a banner calling for free university education during a rally for the Prime Minister were accused of being members of a far-left terrorist group and held in a maximum security jail for 17 months until the charges were finally dropped. At Istanbul's university campus, there's a growing fear among politically active students. Police officers now patrol this campus, as they do in all others in the country. This student, who asked not to be named, is worried. Yeah, we, we are afraid of police forces, for example, on students. Now, for example, I don't want to talk on a uh, mobile phone with my friend for the uh, political subjects, you understand? Because I'm afraid, because uh, someone can hear me. So all, all these events make young people afraid. Observers say there is now increasing concern that the ongoing crackdown may be more about silencing criticism than fighting terrorism. Dorian Jones for VOA News, Istanbul, Turkey. This has been VOA's Middle East Monitor. Join us Monday through Friday for news from the region and of interest to the region. Coming up on International Edition, Kenya asks the Arab world for support in Somalia. Thanks for tuning in to The Voice of America. For more on the stories you've heard on our radio programs, visit our website at voanews.com. That's where you'll find in-depth reports, 
related stories, videos, and more from our team of correspondents. Or take the news with you by downloading podcasts of your favorite VOA program. That's at voanews.com. VOA Online news for a changing world.